Um, so this is me, the principal researcher on this project, but I wanted to you know, give a shout out to our research team. We have several um, student assistants who have done field research and done an excellent job um, in supporting the project. And we also really want to thank um, you know, the school and graduate studies. The whole research grant program has just been wonderful mm -hmm. and allowed us to conduct it is a multiple case study, and we have another component of the project, which is looking at the effect of judicial decisions on Indigenous groups. And Dr. Skork is going to be talking about that um, in a little bit in our presentation. So these are just some snapshots from our research in the field. Um, we have conducted research in Metlakatla, Alaska. Um, there's another community that um, Anthony Kaoli was able to go to in Perryville, Alaska. And then we have gone to Taos, New Mexico to conduct interviews and go to various um, community functions twice. Um, in addition to that, in March, we spent time in Belize and Guatemala. In Belize, we had the opportunity to interview 13 different people, and we may be doing some more um, via Zoom. And in Guatemala, in two days, we powered through um, some group interviews where we had about 37 people. Um, so it was very intensive, but very fruitful. So Christy's going to talk a little bit more about the Community Capitals Framework. And Christy, just let me know when you want me to advance. Okay, go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Watts, for being uh, our, our leader, uh, fearless leader in this. This is a, it's been a fantastic collaborative working experience, um, which we have published on uh, several of the blogs. Um, here is a list of our, our blogs and the, the actual um, uh, PowerPoint has the links embedded in that. If you would like a copy of it, uh, we'd love to share with you our, our experience uh, experiences through each of these locations. Um, uh, it's been fantastic so far. Um, and it's like uh, Dr. Watts is saying, it's a it's still in progress. So we are going through a mountain of data and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be part of this. Okay, next slide. <laughs> the community capitals framework, that's sort of um, something that's very close to home for me. Uh, one of the cool things about interviewing community members about their perception of COVID impacts, the pandemic impacts, um, doing it through the lens of, uh, of community capitals framework is fantastic. Um, the community capitals framework is an asset oriented framework and it looks at multiple lenses actually. Um, looking at the assets of communities, financial capital, political capital, social capital, things of that sort. You can kind of see the, um, the, uh, the figures here. Off to the right, um, that's a figure that I adapted for a previous study, uh, the link to which is, is in the slide as well. But what this does is it, it helps us to, to sort of examine um, sort of a zo if you zoom into an issue, you can kind of start to see and categorize where these impacts have hit the community in different aspects of their life, of their society. And so it's a, it's a complex issue. Um, the, uh, the pandemic is an extremely complex issue with several impacts and not just uh, one-way impacts, but rebounding and synergistic impacts. And, it, and so to map, to sort of map those, this is a really excellent framework and excellent tool. So we've created um, what's called a priori categories. So if you look at human capacity capital, for example, or social capital, what this means is, uh, for example, human ca capacity means knowledge and skills and in so, sort of individual capacities. Um, social capital is more community, uh, how people function as, a, in, as in their relationships and participation in a community. There's natural capital, environmental capital, um, infrastructure capital or built capital, things that um, like telecommunications, um, governance and justice, 
financial, and cultural. So these are the lenses through which we are examining our, our data. So those are the a priori categories. But what's interesting also is that we, through the data, through analyzing the data, we are discovering uh, a posteriori categories, which is um, which is really cool. Uh, it's it's discovering lessons learned, uh, why communities, some communities are resilient in these areas, and um, the sense is when examining the community capitals, if you see some capitals that are perhaps uh, degraded or declining or failing. Um, if a community can invest in those capitals, it sort of lifts the whole system up such that you have a, a, a very good functioning uh, socio-ecological system or, um, or a society on multiple levels. Uh, next slide, that was kind of a long <laughs> explanation, but it's a, it's a, very, uh, it's a very fantastic uh, framework. So our preliminary findings, we presented this at the uh, CICOLAS conference in Antigua, Guatemala in March. Uh, we focused on Taos. Taos is our first um, uh, community. And so we, we have spent most of the time um, examining the data, going through interviews and looking at the various impacts. So we remember socio, socio, social, uh, sociocultural, human, et cetera. So I'm gonna focus on uh, a couple of the impacts and then Dr. Watts will, will, um, will talk about a few others. Uh, but what we're finding, uh, next slide please. Some preliminary impacts on environmental or natural capital for instance. So we're finding both positive and negative impacts. As a result, the, the goal here, if we remember, is to examine and categorize complex COVID-19 impacts to indigenous communities. We have environmental uh, capitals in the positive. What are some positive impacts? Less traffic. But these are things that were perceived by our respondents. So we're, we're taking that data and categorizing it. So less traffic, better air quality, water quality, trail access, sort of a reconnection with nature. Um, and then seeing the environment as a partner, as a healer and getting back to your roots, like farming, things of that sort. There were some negative uh, impacts like solid waste pollution, you see masks, single use plastics, an increase in the use of and uh, disposal of styrofoam and, and plastics, things of that sort. Next slide. Uh, another one of our preliminary findings uh, in the financial capital uh, arena. Um, so a couple of examples of, of what people are saying from the Taos uh, Pueblo. Uh, artists, uh, Taos is a very strong artist community. Uh, artists went from being totally self-sufficient to having to depend uh, on the federal money that was coming in. Um, not knowing so, sort of uh, the insecurity uh, or uncertainty uh, of, of income. And then a positive was that the federal government was providing some relief to the Pueblos and it did help a lot. Um, and that helped the tribal governance. So that this, this uh, financial capital, you can begin to see how that relates and connects directly with uh, governance and, um, and other factors. And just imagine sort of a spider web where it splinters off and all these impacts are, um, are mapped all over, uh, all over the community capitals uh, system. So uh, I believe from here, Dr. Watts will uh, also talk about a couple of other uh, capital um, Capitals Frameworks Impacts. Thank you. Hey there. So just briefly, um, I want to talk a little bit about sociocultural capital. This is one that um, they are separate capitals in the framework, but in our analysis, we were finding that it was very hard to separate them from each other. Um, so we are using a category that we basically created the sociocultural capital. Um, and these are some of the components of social cultural capital, you know, that I won't go through all of those, but just to give you an idea. And so I'm going to jump to our analysis just for the sake of time. Um, but when looking at all these capitals, um, you know, that Dr. Drexler has explained um, and the, the perceived impacts that our subjects reported, these are some of our findings about what went well. And 
this is mainly based on Taos Pueblo. It, you know, the other communities have informed this as well. But that is just because that is the one that we have had the chance to complete the coding, all the interviews, and we're still working on the other ones. So these are, you know, still preliminary findings and we're working on a report for them. So what we found is that their early and decisive action prevented a lot of deaths. They had, you know, maybe five or six deaths. There's, you know, one that's in dispute from COVID um, during the pandemic, which is pretty amazing. You know, granted, they are a small community of, you know, a few thousand people. Um, cultural practices, you know, were also very effective um, for them in both being prepared um, and kind of a culture of self-sufficiency. A blockade that was put in place, um, basically not allowing people onto people who are outside of the Pueblo, not allowing them on, um, was very effective in keeping, of course, outsiders off the Pueblo and limiting exposure. They stood up an emergency response team um, almost right away when the pandemic hit, and that was modeled after FEMA. They used extensive contact tracing um, in order to inform people who were infected and follow up with them. They also used um, multiple means of communication so that they were reaching, um, you know, all community members it, to the extent possible, you know, including radio, social media, and going door to door um, for some people, especially <clears throat> the elderly that might ha not have access to all the other means of communications. They had very strict quarantines, um, especially, you know, initially, but they had support. It's a lot longer um, than many communities and certainly the state of New Mexico. Um, they lifted most of these. Some of them were gradual, but the remaining, you know, mask mandates um, in the blockade were just lifted at the end of September um, of last year. So a lot longer than, you know, the rest of the country. Some of the issues, <clears throat> excuse me, that arose. Social isolation. Uh, while this, of course, was not unique to Indigenous communities, um, it could be argued that it had a greater impact in some ways when you have a small, you know, tight-knit community where cultural traditions um, and practices are so important. Um, this had a huge impact on them. And so one of the things that people found, you know, the most distressing was the change in the, the way that they had to bury people, you know, going from a tradition of having, you know, elaborate rituals and family a friend and friends around um, to having to have their um, loved one taken care of by a funeral home, you know, off of the Pueblo. That was very upsetting to people. Um, and just, you know, it's likely to have kind of a long-term impact on those that were affected by that. And of course, you know, while I mentioned that there were very few deaths um, due to COVID, you know, they also had just deaths due to, you know, your regular factors. So this was um, kind of an ongoing issue for them. Um, the stress on essential workers, of course, with having a 24-hour blockade came, you know, an increase in work time for many people. Um, and one of the things that, you um, they reported to us that was that there was psychological help available uh, for people if you had time um, to do that, but it was a little bit difficult to share experiences um, with tribal members who were providing those resources. So that was a need that was identified um, for this particular Pueblo. Um, so those are just some of our preliminary findings, and I am going to um, move to the next slide and let Dr. Skork talk about the legal aspects of our project. Thank you so much, Dr. Watson, Dr. Drexler. I'm really excited to report to you about four major uh, judicial opinions that were issued by international high courts to protect the rights of Indigenous peoples uh, throughout the Americas uh, during the time of COVID. So could we have the next slide, please? Uh, and the next one also, thank you. So I'm gonna start off with the first decision which came from uh, Brazil. So uh, this was a really important decision because the indigenous people of uh, Brazil were able to coalesce and get legal representation uh, in a way that has never happened with them before in the country's history. Their uh, vulnerability in terms of poverty and susceptibility uh, to disease because of outside people coming in 
to primarily uh, take advantage of natural resources there. Uh, in the past, the medical uh, services for the indigenous people in Brazil were actually administered by the military. So a case was brought, joined by six political parties, uh, requesting the, uh, the Brazil uh, National uh, Supreme Court to order the federal government and the foundation to provide quarantine, specific quarantine uh, procedures to protect the uh, indigenous people, uh, again, from outsiders and to order specific plans to address COVID-19 protections for indigenous peoples. This was a, a highly significant uh, decision and was one of the first ones issued uh, in the time of the pandemic in August of 2020. Next, please. I think one of the things that you'll see as I go through the four various uh, opinions are uh, how uh, each of these opinions reflect the unique indigenous character uh, of the peoples in, in, in their respective countries. So this was a case uh, where a lawsuit was brought to uh, provide an equitable distribution of COVID funds for indigenous people in Canada who live off the formal reservations. Uh, they make up the majority of individuals who are indigenous in Canada, but got only a sliver of the, of the funding. What was quite interesting here is this case was filed. Uh, it brought immediate attention to the inadequacy of the Canadian of the Canadian Parliament uh, in terms of equitable distribution of funds. And very shortly, it was the case was settled, and not the uh, the optimal amount of uh, settlement figure was arrived at, but a considerable one. So it was an interesting situation where the power of public opinion really uh, controlled here. Getting the, the lawsuit filed was enough to bring the, the matter to the attention uh, of the electorate and the uh, parliament uh, immediately turned around to avoid uh, any farther uh, distance on what was a really shameful uh, initial decision. Next slide, please. So Ecuador. So Ecuador had a uh, another interesting uh, case where instead of having a situation that was random, uh, essentially 52 card pickup in terms of coordinating services and protections for indigenous people, for the very first time there was a uh, a national court decision ordering the government to coordinate their services and to be held accountable for them. And uh, the next slide, thank you. So in the United States, it's, it's quite interesting. So where the legal uh, battle went in the United States was actually between the Native American tribes uh, uh, that crossed the entire nation. So Congress set aside uh, an $8 billion fund for uh, to fund uh, COVID treatment and COVID programs for uh, Native Amer American Indian tribes. And uh, as I have here, I'll give you a little bit of history here. In 1971, the Department of Treasury created Alaska Native Corporations in lieu of traditional Indian reservations. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs subsequently affirmed that all Alaska Native villages would remain federally recognized tribes. Now, despite that, uh, three very large tribes, uh, four actually, the Navajo Nation, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Chehalis Reservation argued that their share of the $8 billion funding opportunities would be unfairly marginalized by allowing the Alaska Nat Native Corporations uh, to uh, share in that money, essentially saying uh, the Alaska Native Corporations were not uh, uh, American Indian tribes for the purpose of sharing these $8 billion of funds. What makes this case so amazingly 
uh, significant is uh, over and over and over again, historically, uh, the uh, the courts, uh, the national, the our federal government has uh, made it very clear that the Alaska Native uh, corporations should be treated as American Indian tribes in every sense of the word. Notwithstanding that, the case had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court to essentially say what had already been established for many years. Uh, and it wasn't a unanimous Supreme Court decision. It was six to three. So take it in their entirety. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can we go back? Excuse me, Michelle. Uh, so take it in their entirety. What's the significance of these four cases? So we've got four cases in the Americas uh, where uh, Supreme Courts or their equivalents have assumed jurisdiction for the protection of indigenous peoples for a wide range of rights. And during the time of uh, a pandemic or even an epidemic, this type of focus on indigenous peoples uh, throughout a specific region of the world, unprecedented. Thank you. And our last um, slide is just a summary. Um, I know we were short on time, so we were happy to, if there are questions, we are happy to take questions or comments now. Michelle, can you show the last slide, the very last one? This, by the way, was uh, the rooftop view from, An from Antigua during the Cicolas presentation. <laughs> See the active volcano off to the right? It's Fuego and Aguas to the left. <laughs> Sorry to say, I have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great picture. <laughs> so I'll tell you, it's a, it's a real tease to summarize uh, four uh, court decisions that are that significant in a short period of time. And if anybody has any uh, specific questions about one of the cases, I'd be happy to uh, to respond to that here or uh, after our presentation. There's really quite a bit of backstory for each one. Stacy asked in the chat how you all determined which communities to work with. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we did it a lot by um, well, a combination of factors. So for New Mexico, we contacted every Pueblo and asked if they would like to participate. We, you know, met with a couple of them and kind of explained um, how we thought this could be beneficial. And, you know, basically the project, what we want is for it to be beneficial for them. So, you know, it's like they really had to kind of want to do it. Of course, we need their permission anyway, but we wanted them to, you know, give us their input um, and make it as beneficial for them as possible. So of, you know, of the Pueblos, which I think they're, 22 or so, maybe a little bit more, um, one ended up participating. Um, and for our other communities, we, we basically reached out to communities where we had some access and some relationship. Um, you know, I've done research in Metlakatla before. Um, and so we had some contacts there to be able to, you know, kind of better talk to them. We, we did reach out to additional communities as well, uh, but it was <clears throat> of course a lot easier to um, go to a community where we had a, a you know relationship before, so that was the case with Christy in Belize, and you know I had some contacts in Guatemala um, where I had worked with them before. Um, so, you know, ideally, of course, we would visit a lot more, but we also found that you know we already have an incredible volume of information, so um, we you know kind of have to limit how many communities you can go to um, anyway. So, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, also, can I uh, dovetail off of that one, Dr. Watson, in that um, while we were uh, contacting the Pueblos and tribes in New Mexico, which is where I live in the state, um, it, it remember back, uh, not even, I mean, you know, this is a year or so ago, and we're reaching out to, to these communities, and they're, you know, they're still very much in lockdown, they're still very much in 
you know, we have our, our borders are closed, actual physical gate and entry um, is closed to the public. So a lot of people uh, had, um, and rightly so, you know, look, we're not, we, we can't really do this right now. <laughs> this is not, uh, this is not what we can do. So um, kudos to Taos and a few other communities that were uh, considering, and then Taos was the first to, to say yes. Um, kudos to them. And I think they found uh, value in the study. Uh, and it's the most important thing for me to, for any research that we're doing, that I do, that we all do, is that it's used. It doesn't just sit on a shelf somewhere, but it's actually used um, and applied. So um, I think what was interesting to Taos specifically and Belize um, uh, and also probably to the other ones, but I think I've heard directly from, from uh, members of those communities that uh, knowing what assets they have, the, the capitals, after we examine the capitals and knowing what assets they have and what assets uh, they need to, to pour resources into is what will be helpful for them. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, as Christy was saying, the first time we went to Taos, um, we had all our interviews and meetings in a visitor center that was right outside the Pueblo. So we did not go beyond that blockade. Um, so it was nice that they also invited us back um, for a festival, but also to, to do more interviews when, when the Pueblo was open, when they just started to open up. So we kind of had both experiences. I see a comment in the, um, in the meeting chat. Uh, from Summer uh, Katubi saying, I'm shocked by the decision of the Supreme Court. Me too. Uh, and it really showed the impact of uh, how strong, uh, how strongly uh, the tribes can uh, be at odds with one another when $8 billion is involved. Uh, because of the court decision, uh, Alaska Native corporations received $500 million that they wouldn't have received otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you all so much for your time and dedication to this project. It's always, it's fantastic getting to hear the progress of everything. I'm, I'm on the other side of things. So it's great to see how things are progressing and um, you're in sharing your experiences as, as well. Um, it's, it's almost time for our next set of mm -hmm. uh, presenters here.